there was a report from Reuters back in 2018 that detailed how Johnson & Johnson knew about the carcinogenic properties in its baby powder, in its talc powder, since the 1950s. You've made it to Not Billable, the Law Trades podcast that brings you bite-sized legal and business news updates, full event replays, and conversations with legal pros about what's going on behind the scenes every week. Stop the clock, put the timesheet down, it's time to get started. Hey everybody, I'm Oren Pellick from Law Trades, back with our weekly news update, joined by Law Traders extraordinaire, Matt Margolis. Matt, how you doing, man? That was so sweet of you. I'm, uh, I don't know, what, I, I, guess, I, I guess you could say I'm living the dream. Oh, there it is. There it is. Glad to hear. <laughs> so, this is going to get old eventually. Like, people are listening to this and they're like, all right, Matt, I think people are, enough. they're only listening to hear you say that you're living the dream. I think that's what it actually is. Everything else we do is just a bonus. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> all right. So what are we talking about this week? So this week we're looking at the, uh, the Johnson & Johnson uh, bankruptcy case, basically, and, and what's going on there. Uh, the DOJ is filing an antitrust lawsuit against uh, Alphabet or Google's parent company. Uh, and also uh, Silicon Valley is dealing with some uh, some pirate situation. So we'll, we'll talk through that. Plus some smaller stories. Uh, Rick Astley, he's never going to let you down. We'll explain what that means. And Meta is reversing its course on a two-year-old decision. So let's jump in, first of all, with Project Plato. And that was the name that Johnson & Johnson gave to its Texas two-step plan which is effectively, it was being sued by some 38,000 plaintiffs for mm -hmm. uh, you know having carcinogenic baby powder or other kind of talc powder products, is now liable for some 3.5 billion in settlements and verdicts. So it set up uh, a subsidiary called LTL Management in this case uh, to shoulder all the litigation and all that burden and then went to a uh, bankruptcy court to file bankruptcy and kind of get rid of it. However, the U.S. Third Circuit Court of Appeals said, you can't do that. You're a $400 billion company. You're not bankrupt. This doesn't work. It's uh, This is a classic playbook. So the Texas two-step, if you're listening, again, what, what Orange just said is you take all of your liabilities, you stick them to a subsidiary, you file BK. And this has been used time in and time out in environmental related litigation, toxic tort, things that you have a lot of long tail claims, so claims that take a while to accrue um, and like cancer, claims that are like, okay, exactly. So like commonly you see it in like asbestos kinds of litigation, uh, PFAS, you probably see it already in that, these kinds of chemical related litigation matters, which again have long tail claims, which if you're listening, you don't know what long tail is, means it's long, right? It, it takes a long time for that claim to, to accrue and for a lawsuit to be filed and voluminous, right? So when you think toxic tort and you think these chemicals, uh, things, right? These things that can cause folks to get sick. It's usually a mass of litigation. It's not just one or two people. It's, you know, hundreds of thousands of people have been exposed to X, Y, and Z. And that's where this litigation comes from. So commonly speaking, you have 50,000 lawsuits and you shelter it to one company, company files bankruptcy and you're out, right? You're like, oh, I don't, I don't have any liability. You have to blame company over there. But this is not the first major company to do this and not the first major company yeah. to do this and do it successfully. So oh yeah, what happened? Why I, this is why the change? It's just a stance. I don't know. Maybe a court is, is generally speaking, especially like JJ is such a major player. But that being said, there are large companies who have, who mm -hmm. have done either the Texas two-step or something very similar. Yeah. Large, massive corporations. So I this is definitely unforeseen maybe we're seeing a change um in how courts approach this method of absolving a you know corporate liability yeah um but it's but, it's something that i personally when i saw this news i was i was taken aback because this right. is such a again i'm not condoning the practice but this is such a common practice in this, in this kind of arena really took me off guard but this is the Circuit Court of Appeals, right? It's not the Supreme Court. I'm sure J&J &J is going to file this. This could go further and this could get overturned. Sure. Correct? Now, even if that does very, happen, true. but even if that does happen, do other companies now see that there was some sort of hiccup in this plan and maybe think twice about it next time? Or are yes. people just going to keep doing this? Yeah. No, absolutely. I think you look at this, you're like, how do I learn from this mistake? If it's... right. I mean, generally speaking, you're going to have folks forum shop. I don't want to be anywhere close to this jurisdiction. I don't want to be anywhere close to the Third Circuit. I want to be in a completely different circuit, uh, different bankruptcy court. 
uh, if I if I make this maneuver. Um, so I think it's funny because it's called the Texas two step, but the Third Circuit's not Texas. They would be the fifth. <laughs> Um, so maybe you can maybe do it in Texas, but, um, it, it definitely, you're right in that point as well as I'm sure this is going to be going to the Supreme court. At least there's going to be, uh, a petition to the Supreme court on this issue because it is it's certainly a, again, a, a multi-billion dollar question, <laughs> a mm-hmm. multi-billion dollar issue. Right. So, exactly. um, fully, fully expect that and agreed if you're, if you're a company and this is your tactic, or at least you just realize that you have a large swath of litigation coming your way enough litigation that could sink your company if you don't engage in some sort of you know tactic like the texas two-step should be should be paying attention should certainly be paying attention to this now the texas two-step aside just to shine more light on this case specifically uh, the reason uh, you know this this story we're talking about project plato is because that is what johnson and johnson internally was calling this maneuver uh, they were calling this the, te- the Project Plato is how they were going to get out of this liability. Sure. And not only that, but there was a report from Reuters back in 2018 that detailed how Johnson & Johnson knew about the carcinogenic properties in its baby powder, in its talc powder, since the 1950s. And they were dealing with the yeah, FDA it, it in the back- 1970s. Yeah, it goes back to, listen, in this kind of litigation, you're going to look also at asbestos litigation. It's very similar. It's, a, it's the same. I think a, a, yeah. a form of asbestos is in the talc, exactly. I believe, is the... And again, yes. I, if you're listening to this, I'm not, I'm not an asbestos expert. I'm just... I, I, it's my understanding. Um, yeah, there's some horrible... I, and not just from Johnson & Johnson. I think there are some pretty aggressive, horrible documents across this kind of space where folks were saying... I think there's a famous one in asbestos where it's like, if you... If you live horrible, I think it's like if you live by asbestos, you live as a result of asbestos, you die by asbestos. Some horrible, huh. horrible, horrible document, and that's what you find in this kind of litigation, especially in the toxic tort realm. Um, again, I'm not saying Johnson Johnson. I'm not speaking to liability for Johnson Johnson. This is the lawyer coming out in full force, like Johnson Johnson. You're listening to this, like <laughs> I'm not. I don't know, right? Because I'm not the jury. Sure. I'm not the trier of fact. But that being said, in this type of arena, it is heavily litigious, and there is a uh, there's certainly a history to it. Right. Now, to tie it back, does that then change? Does that affect the opinion of the of the three judge panel at the circuit court? Does that affect? No, no, no because I because I, I it's my understanding. I believe there have been for asbestos is the most common comparison. I believe like there has been the same kind of um, tool utilized. I say tool, legal tool um, in the asbestos arena. So it. it's happened before like this. Yeah. <laughs> Well, change course this time, and uh, we'll see if it goes to the Supreme Court or, or what happens next. But it's, uh, it'll be interesting Absolutely. to find out. Yeah. Well, oh, let's move on to another massive company that's facing uh, <laughs> litigation, uh, and that is Alphabet, which is Google's parent company. Uh, now, if you'll remember in 2020, uh, the Trump uh, administration's DOJ filed uh, an antitrust lawsuit against Alphabet. Mm. That was for search, right, for online search. Now, the Biden administration is taking its aim uh, at Google and is attacking its online advertising industry, saying that it's basically anti-competitive, it dominates the entire market, and they want its ad company to be uh, broken off and to break up Alphabet in that sense. It's interesting. I mean, it makes sense because, like, Google owns, like, all, I mean, at least allegedly owns, like, all sides of the coin, right? They own the brokers, Mm -hmm. they are the advertiser, they facilitate the advertisements, they own the tools. (laughs) Like, they are in that space. Not only are they in that space, they own that space. Now, there are other players, don't get me wrong, in that market, but Google definitely has a significant market share. Significant. So I, I, I understand the lawsuit. You say other players. Uh, my understanding is outside of Google, it's Meta, and those are the two, and that's basically the entire market. You yeah. might have some very small other players, players, but or <laughs> in Meta. But yeah, what's interesting, right. <laughs> what's interesting to me is, let's say you were to spin out uh, the ad in the ad business from mm-hmm. Alphabet. That's what keeps the doors open. That's what keeps the lights on at Alphabet. That's what keeps Google Search free, YouTube. Uh, you know, it's costs down everything. So if that happens, you might see a fundamental reshaping of how, you know, the internet works about how things move or other players coming in. I'm not sure. No. No, it's fair. It could easily be that case. It could also be the case that they don't spin off the entire advertising arm, maybe pieces of it. So you only have a a certain sector of it. Maybe the 
broker side of it's gone. Maybe some of the tools are spun off into different little subsidiaries that are not sold off completely. I say subsidiaries that are smaller companies that no longer are owned yeah. by Google or within the grasp of Google uh, Alphabet could easily go in different directions. I'm sure that's an argument posed by Google. Who was to say like, this is, we don't, we don't, one, we're not anti-competitive. We, you know, we have all these other players, but two, you know, if you spin these things off, like, it, it's effectively our entire business. It's our entire business model. Right. Whether that's persuasive or not, whether that's even a good argument. Thankfully, I'm not an antitrust attorney, and the folks listening to this are probably laughing at me. But um, it's certainly something I would say as Google, like this is this is our business model. This is us. Right. Now that being yeah. said, um, it's I mean it's certainly not the <laughs> a lot of antitrust recently. A lot of antitrust. So, Look, I uh, mean, and we've talked about this gonna... before, Silicon Valley ballooned and became just a handful of companies mm-hmm. that run so much of our lives. And uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it was a long time coming, right? It's not a surprise to anyone. I, I think this is a joke someone said recently. They said, I'm old enough to remember when the, when the internet was not five websites. <laughs> and like that, and, it, and it's a joke, but it makes, comp- I mean, it's true though. Like our lives are consumed by like these five or six conglomerates and like Mm -hmm. that's it so i i think it's fair to say we're uh government is taking notice plus you also can you can uh de you know create this like demon look right like i say demon i mean like villainize you can villainize big tech and kind of go after big tech um and it's a bipartisan issue it's absolutely right it's absolutely right yeah so yeah i mean We'll see where this goes, but uh, and it's not just the U.S., right? It's the EU as well. It's it's other jurisdictions, but Silicon Valley is fighting for its life at the moment. Well, let's stay in Silicon Valley and let's talk about uh, something we talked about last time, which is ChatGBT. Uh, its owner, OpenAI, has another tool with GitHub called Copilot. What Copilot does is very, very similar to ChatGPT in that it's kind of a suggestive, generative uh, uh, coding text. So if I'm writing code for for my website, Copilot can kind of suggest a line of code here and there to fill in what I'm doing. Now, to do this, you have to scrape a lot of code from the internet, and now GitHub and OpenAI are getting sued by all these you know um, programmers saying you stole our code, sure. you stole our copyright. This is piracy. Uh, this was this was inevitable. This was such this an is, inevitable lawsuit. Uh, and you're going to see more of these. You're going to see 100% right. more of these. Like, how do you teach these AI tools without... You're right. If it's a coding tool, the coding. Uh, if it's an art-related tool, the art. Like, any of these different uh, items to you know that you need to train up the AI. So, I mean, this is just the start of many. Yeah, it is the start of many. And, and relatedly, you have uh, Getty Images, which is OpenAI has a third kind of AI, which is called DAL-E, which is a, an art generator. It scraped so much of Getty Images, and Getty Images said, hey, if you wanted to do this, you could have licensed from us. We have a specific licensing model for uh, data scraping, you just and you didn't it. do that. <laughs> huh? Yeah, you're just going to pay for it. It's like, it's, yeah. it's really like, guys, like this happens all the time. You should have just, just paid for this. But we talked about this in the past with kind of like the smaller artists. I do think that it's going to take these bigger companies to step in and say, hey, 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 we're Disney, Absolutely. we're Getty Images, we're these bigger companies, and you're taking from us, and this is piracy. Absolutely. You are not going to, unless you have this conglomeration, like an association, right? Association of small artists who can pool together resources. You, uh, you're not going to see it otherwise. You're literally not going to see these lawsuits or you're going to see small lawsuits. I do think in, in, in the copyright realm, in the IP realm, there is fee entitlement for certain claims, which helps, right? You have some, maybe you'll have these law firms that will come in and on contingency, well, like sort of contingency, right? Like it's fee entitlement, you're going to have fee entitlement and represent a bunch of these people and go one after the other after the other. But more realistically, it's companies like this, asserting yeah. these big, big lawsuits, each side having very large law firms that can be funded. And uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So this will be a continuing fight across multiple AI generators, but uh, it'll be interesting to see where where copyright law lands with all this because this is a this is a new frontier. Is, I mean, it's hard, listen. Don't get me wrong. Like, I you feel for the folks, especially that like things have been taken from them. Their art, their 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 intellectual property. You know, it's them. It's truly an extension of them. Yeah. Um, 
again, this is reminding me of like a tweet where it's like, this is horrible for the government, but God, this is great content. <laughs> this is like, <laughs> like, this is horrible for the, this is horrible, but like, man, this is great for IP law. <laughs> it's definitely cool to see this fleshed out. The academic yes. in me as the human, I'm yeah. like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> there are two sides here, clearly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, pivot to some of the smaller stories for this week. So first up, Rick Astley. Rick Astley is suing rapper Young Gravy for just flagrantly, as he says, copying his uh, uh, Never Gonna Give You Up, that song, his, his line from that song, uh, and yeah. a Young Gravy song, which you know, apparently, huh? I love this song. Listen, we're going to probably post this on TikTok at some point, because um, that's what we do with all of these clips. Shout out to Young Gravy if you're listening to this. Um, sorry about the lawsuit. I mean, we're not involved. Sorry, you have to be a part of it. But that song is great. And you, yeah, the, the, you, and that part from Rick Astro, definitely there is a sample in there. <laughs> but you know I mean, hey, it's a cool song. And there's no bad promotion. I now know who Young Gravy is, and a lot more people do too. That's so right. It might, uh, Listen, it might pay utilizing off for the ju- <laughs> Utilizing the judiciary to promote yourself. It's all content at the end of the day. It's all content. It's all content, it's all content baby. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, let's close out with uh, with a reinstatement of sorts, and that is former President Trump, uh, after two years, uh, is being reinstated, is, is Facebook and Instagram accounts, mm-hmm. uh, which is kind of an interesting move by Meta. A lot of people are reading this as them... Um, sort of mitigating their their content moderation policy like hey look we're bringing this person back they know the rules we're doing the right thing so whatever this person is going to do now that they're back on is beyond our control we have these things set up and and, you know we'll deal with it later but we're doing the right thing with content moderation that's that's kind of how it's being viewed and it's it's a pretty interesting move it is. I mean, it really is just an appeasement to the critics, right? I think you have um, folks on the, the writer side of the spectrum saying, like, generally speaking, uh, left-leaning folks are provided more leeway on these platforms. And then on the left-hand side, you're saying, look, you're having these folks come on and they're spewing um, hate speech. Or, like, I think for Donald Trump is a perfect example when you talk about, like, um, January 6th and those events, like, uh, perpetuating violent or creating these, these events of violence. Um and they're just trying to like juggle, I guess is the best right. way to put it. Right. Um, and it's it's certainly something that you're seeing on Twitter more than anything. Um, and you're gonna probably see it from other uh, social media platforms, especially as you see more and more fight over like section two. Of, um, oh my gosh. Wow, I'm not cutting this out because I want people to know that I literally forgot this. <laughs> I want people to remember this. I want people and I'm not the this. lawyer, so I don't need to know this. <laughs> the relevance, the relevance section that we all know that starts with a two, relating to immunity for these social media platforms. Good save. Platforms. Excellent save. I there we go. There we go. <laughs> that's it. So I th- I think that's the backdrop of this as well, where right. you're seeing a lot of discussion over that, repealing it. I know there's certain legislation currently the Supreme or not legislation, oh my gosh. Uh litigation at the Supreme Court level. So mm-hmm. um I'm I'm sure that's kind of the play here from Meta where it's like all this going on in the backdrop, we're trying to be like, Hey, look how neutral we are. Right. Um, don't, you know, let's let's not rock the boat. Yeah. Yeah. And you brought up Twitter. It's interesting. Twitter has a much more lax uh, content moderation policy. So they're all, you know, they're not really kind of the center of the heat here. Do they have one? Do they have a content moderation uh, policy? TBD. I probably would have been kicked <laughs> off already. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, if I dumb but, tweets, I would have been kicked off already. <laughs> but, but in reality, it, it seems like Meta is really kind of leading the forefront on this because they've actually taken more heat uh, in the past for this. So they're, they're yep. you know. They're straddling this. They're trying to figure it out. Always. Listen, yeah. they've they've been leading the charge for you know since really MySpace cooled down. So it mm-hmm. is they're they're the ones that always have to be the forefront of this. Is how, yeah. uh, thanks for leading the charge, I guess. Well, on that note, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for joining me and for talking me through thanks, these. Man. I always appreciate it, and for everyone for listening, we appreciate Likewise. it as well. Thanks, guys. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Check us out also on LinkedIn and Twitter to keep up to speed with what we're doing. Catch you on the next one.